Howdy, folks. Welcome you into our Bible study tonight. Good to see you. It is cold and icy, and if you don't love that, miserable out. Uh, <clears throat> and then on top of all that, the other day, that rodent that lives in Punxsutawney saw his shadow and said, we get six more weeks of this, right? So uh, hopefully we get a warming trend here in a week or so. But hope, uh, hope you're well, and it's good to be able to study for a few minutes more tonight on this topic that we started last week, and appreciate you being a part of that. So we will uh, we will uh, get that started. So last week we started study on peace, looking at peace in the Bible, what it is, um, what does that word mean in Scripture. Where do we find it? How do we keep it once we found it? That kind of thing. And we tried really to emphasize one major point um, that sort of undergirds the whole st study from beginning to end. And that is that when, when people in normally think of peace, they think of peace as, as the absence of something. That is, the absence of war, the absence of conflict or difficult times. Uh, when they don't have those things, then that to them is peace. Uh, but we tried to show last week that, that peace is not the absence of those things. It's actually the presence of something, and in particular someone, and the presence of the Lord. And you can have peace in the midst of all those bad things if uh, you have the Lord, and um, I think that's a really important point uh, in understanding what real peace is. So we looked at about four different texts, a couple in the Gospel of Luke and a couple in the Gospel of John last week uh, to sort of develop that main point, and we're going to continue uh, sort of emphasizing that and, and looking at some new stuff tonight. I um, thought we'd start with a couple of prophets in the Old Testament, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, both those prophets condemned the people of their day who were saying, peace, peace. Um, to understand what's going on there, uh, you know, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel realized what was coming. That is, God was is going to be punishing his people uh, for their rebellion, their sin, their worship of idols, their mistreatment of the poor and anybody that they had power over, all kinds of things that, that led to the destruction of, of, uh, of Jerusalem, of, of Judah, by the Babylonian armies. Uh, and men like Jeremiah and Ezekiel said this was going to happen, <clears throat> they were sort of looking into the future for this, and many of the people didn't believe them, didn't want to hear it, um, and so one of the things that, that they often heard, that is Jeremiah and Ezekiel, was people saying, hey, look around, everything's great, peace, peace, and yet both these prophets said there is no peace. So it sort of coming at it from the from another way um, than we did last week. You might look around and say, "Hey, everything's going great. Uh, there's no war. Nobody's persecuting me. Uh, things are, in life are the way I want them to be." And so you say, "I'm at peace." And yet, there is a possibility that that's really not the situation. If you're not in the Lord you're really not in, at peace. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel um, said to the people, uh, you're just fooling yourselves. So, you know, the people were saying there's no war at the moment, so there is peace. The prophets knew better. Peace is not the absence of war. And they 
probably weren't very successful in convincing the folks of that, at least until they saw the armies assembling against the city, and then it was too late. Uh, but that's, that's one thing we see. Uh, backing up a little bit in, in time with the prophets, let's think about something that happened in uh, the time of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is earlier than, than, uh, than uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And it, Isaiah is prophesying and thinking of a, a future where the Assyrians... That, that was the great power before the Babylonians. The Assyrians were going to sweep in and punish God's people. And one of the kings that, that Isaiah, Isaiah deals with is Hezekiah. You might remember Hezekiah. He was one of the few good kings, although he's not perfect. Uh, he is one of the few good kings. He, he did some important things uh, in devotion to God and led people... Um, led the nation more toward God. Many of the kings were awful and led the people into idolatry and so forth. Hezekiah was pretty good, although he had some pretty significant flaws. In fact, the one thing I want to point out tonight is uh, a really awful attitude that, that Hezekiah displayed at one point. Uh, we could look at this in the book of Kings, but also here in Isaiah. So Isaiah in chapter 39 uh, tells a story that took place in the reign of King Hezekiah. Uh, what's the story? Basically, there are some political envoys who come from uh, Babylon. Um, Babylon is not yet the great power. They're right on the verge of it. Remember we said the Assyrians were the real threat. But during the days of King Hezekiah, there were these envoys that came from Babylon to visit Jerusalem. And Hezekiah sort of foolishly shows them all his wealth and riches and takes them into the temple and so forth and sort of shows off the greatness of, of uh, Judah. And uh, this does not make Isaiah happy. And, and he rebukes Hezekiah for this. And, and so forth. Uh, the idea being that, you know, now you've sent all these uh, Babylonians back with great ideas in mind to one day sweep in here and take all this stuff that you were bragging about. So this occurs again in Isaiah chapter 39. I just want to read a few verses uh, where Isaiah is confronting King Hezekiah about this, beginning at verse 5 of chapter 39 of Isaiah. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Now, remember, he's just shown these foreigners all the stuff you know, that he was proud of. And then Isaiah comes and says, Look, the day is coming when when all this stuff's going to be taken away to Babylon. That's quite a ways in the future from Isaiah's day, but he's exactly right. That's what will happen. So he says, you know, uh, this is going to happen. He goes on. He says, nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Then verse 7, and some of your own sons, this would be grandsons, great-grandsons that, that kind of thing. Some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So that's Hezekiah being a believer in the Lord and a pretty devoted follower. That has to be troubling, uh, a troubling prophecy to hear from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, you know, these people are going to come back and take all the stuff and your own sons are going to be taken away into captivity. Isaiah or Hezekiah uh, understood he meant his descendants, not literally his first generation of children. Um, but, you know, they're going to be taken away and mistreated 
uh, in this foreign land of Babylon. But the, the terrible attitude that Hezekiah displays is in the eighth verse. It says there, Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. And then Isaiah, the, the, the writer, tells us what King Hezekiah was thinking. So he said, he said these things that really, they don't sound good, do they? All your stuff is going to be taken and your son's going to be taken away. And then Hezekiah says, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. What in the world does he mean? Here's what he's thinking. Uh, chapter 39 ends this way where Isaiah tells us, for he thought there will be peace and security in my days. So King Hezekiah is thinking, yeah, it's an awful, awful prophecy. I don't have to worry about it because it's not going to happen while I'm around. There will be peace and security in my days. Hezekiah was extremely short-sighted, wasn't he? And really displays this, this terrible attitude. And um, we can look at other places in Scripture where people have sort of this, this view that as long as it's okay while I'm around, I'm not really going to worry about what happens in the future as a result of my actions. That's really not peace. You see, the invasion uh, and the destruction from Babylon was not going to happen during the reign of Hezekiah. It was going to be in the reign of his grandsons, great-grandsons, and so forth. Um, but it didn't really concern him because he wouldn't be there. There's no peace in that, you see. Uh, there'll be peace and security in my days, Hezekiah thinks, but the fact is uh, there wasn't because he wasn't in line with, with the Lord at the moment. Uh, another place where uh, we, we can sort of reflect on this is in uh, the New Testament now, in the letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians letter in chapter 5. But we'd read a couple of verses there this evening. 1 Thessalonians 5, the first three verses. Now, uh, if you're familiar with the, the letter to the Thessalonians, both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Paul talks a lot about the end of the world, the, the end of time. What's it going to be like when the Lord returns and so forth? The Thessalonians had some mistaken ideas that Paul wanted to correct. Uh, and that's sort of what he's in the midst of doing here in 1st Thessalonians chapter 5. But listen to what he says and then see how it links with what we're talking about. It begins, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, let me pause here a moment. One thing we often see in the New Testament letters, especially Paul's letters, is you can tell he's responding to questions that have been sent to him or things he's aware of that are going on in the church that he needs to teach about or respond to. When he says, now concerning, at the beginning of verse 1, now, concerning the times and the season, we can almost imagine, can't we, a question that's come to him from the Thessalonians about, you know, what what's the uh, the time of the second coming? Uh, what should we look for? The kinds of signs and so forth. And he's responding to that. So, again, he begins, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So uh, Paul reminds them of this idea that uh, the second coming, while we might not know, be able to put a date on it or a specific day or year, one thing we do know about it is when it comes, it'll come suddenly like a thief in the night. You're not prepared for a thief in the night. Uh, but that's what the day of the Lord will be like. But notice, it goes on and describes this further in verse 3. While people are saying, 
there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Think about that description in light of in, in light of our study. What's he saying? When when the Lord returns, when the second coming takes place, there'll be people living their lives thinking that all is fine. Things are going fine for them. They're saying things like, hey, it's great. We have peace and security. And then suddenly, these people who are not prepared for the return of the Lord because they have not gotten into Christ, uh, suddenly, destruction will come upon them. Almost like you think about the parallel situation back in the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, where people were saying, peace, peace. And yet suddenly, they were going to look out the walls of Jerusalem and see the Babylonian armies encircling their city. Um, much like that with the second coming of Christ, there will be people who, who are going about their lives, living it up. You know, maybe they're wealthy and they feel like they've got peace and security. And then suddenly, uh, destruction comes upon them. That is, Jesus returns and he comes back as judge of all the earth. And then he gives an, an illustration. What's that going to be like as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman? You know, again, <clears throat> I know with, with modern medicine, sometimes we can almost determine exactly when uh, the birth will take place, uh, especially if... if uh, Doctors decide to induce that kind of thing. But you think about it from Paul's perspective in the first century. Uh, they didn't know uh, with great specificity when uh, labor pains would start. And so it was a good illust illustration for that time. But you see the, the idea people are saying, hey, we have peace and security. Uh, we're, we're in a good time. There's not war. And no one's threatening us. They don't realize uh, that, that judgment is coming, you see. Just because there's the absence of war, difficulties, threats, um, that does not mean a person has peace. Uh, peace is found in Jesus. And so you can have peace in, in good times. You can have peace in the midst of a storm. Uh, Jesus certainly did. He was able to sleep in a boat on Galilee when a storm raged around that boat. The disciples thinking they're about to die and Jesus can sleep. Why? He's there, you know. And that is the way to understand peace. Peace is the presence of Jesus. Um, and, and so I thought this was a, a good illustration of what we're talking about. One other place I wanted us to go to tonight, um, we spent some time last week in the Gospel of John. And just to read a couple of verses in John again, 14, chapter 14 of John. Um, again, if you, if you uh, tuned in last week, this long section in, in the Gospel of John, chapters 13 through 17, uh, all in take place in the same night. Most of it is Jesus teaching his disciples, preparing them for what's about to happen, his arrest and his crucifixion the next day. And so that's where we're jumping into again. It makes sense that Jesus would be talking about things, um, doesn't it, that, that make for peace and that he would be using this word a lot. So in chapter 14, verse 25, the, the Lord speaks to the guys and he says, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. See, he's about to leave them. I've spoken these things to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. By the way, notice there, we've got all three members of the Godhead. Jesus is speaking. He's referring to the Holy Spirit who's coming and 
he tells us who sends the Spirit, the Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. They were going to forget all this stuff that Jesus is teaching them on this important evening because of the events of the next 24, 48 hours. It was all going to go away. They're going to be hiding behind locked doors and so forth. Uh, but the Spirit was going to remind them. Uh, once the Spirit was sent to them. He finishes in verse 27. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So that uh, twice Jesus uses the word that we're studying there, and he he promises he's, he's leaving them peace. He's giving them peace. Um, but the question is, what does that mean? And I wanted to refer, I don't, don't normally do this, but I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And in particular, I have a study Bible based on the English Standard Version. It has all kinds of notes at, at the bottom of the page. You can sort of see uh, the text up here and then the notes you, you may have a Bible like that. So the, the, the note for verse 27 of John 14, I thought was pretty good. I, I wanted to share uh, what it said because it comments on the word peace. So the footnote, you know, one thing I always try to mention to people, get a, a study Bible that has footnotes like this. Always remember that the footnotes are not inspired. They're written by people like me, commentators and, and so forth. Sometimes we're wrong. So the text is inspired. The footnotes, not, not always are. you got to check them closely. And there are footnotes in the ESV study Bible that are just wrong on some things. I think this one's pretty good. I think uh, it teaches some important things. So the footnote, footnote to John 14, 27 says, the expression peace from the Hebrew word shalom, which we'll talk about more uh, future weeks, the expression peace had a much richer connotation than the English word does, since it conveyed not merely the absence of conflict and turmoil, but also the notion of positive blessing, especially in terms of a right relationship with God. So you see how that sort of expresses what we've been saying, that peace is not the absence of something, it's the presence of God, the presence of the Lord. And it involves blessing. Okay? And then it goes on and says, and also, as a result, the idea that all is well in one's life uh, is, is sort of the way of understanding uh, peace, that all is well. That is, if we're talking about in, in terms of um, being in relationship with the Lord. And that, that is when all is well. Then the, the note finishes, uh, this may be manifested most clearly amid persecution and tribulation. Uh, see how you can have peace in the midst of persecution and tribulation. And that's exactly what's going to happen to the disciples that Jesus is speaking to here, of course. Now, what are they about to face? They're about to see their master crucified, tortured and crucified, put in a tomb, and they're all figuring it's going to happen to them too, so they hide away behind locked doors. And... When Je remember when Jesus comes to them after he's raised, what's the first word he speaks to them? Peace. Um, and they still have a lot to learn about what that means. And they will. And we'll see it in the book of Acts, where they can endure great persecution and still have peace. One other reference, just a couple of chapters later in the 16th chapter of John, Again, it's the same 
evening, Jesus in the upper room with the disciples. He's teaching them, trying to prepare them for what's about to happen. And the very last verse of, of John 16, he says this to them. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Now, he's about to be killed, and he's about to leave them. So how is it possible that they're going to have peace? Well, it's not possible in the way the world understands peace. Uh, but it's possible in relationship with Jesus. I have said these things to you that in me you, ha you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So they're, they're going to have persecution, tribulation, trouble in the world. And, and Jesus isn't taking them out of the world. Uh, in his great prayer in the following chapter, chapter 17, as he speaks to the Father, he says, I'm not asking you, Father, to take them out of the world, but, but to preserve them. Uh, so they're going to have to endure this time. Uh, but you know, they're, they're going to face a lot of tribulation. But he is speaking these words to them so that in him they may have peace. Basic point tonight, where is peace found? In what we've looked at so far, where is peace found? How do you find peace? Well, peace is found in Jesus. Peace is found in the Lord. It's the presence of the Lord in our lives that gives us peace. And so, we can have the presence of the Lord in the midst of a storm, in the midst of persecution, tribulation, difficulties. We can have peace if we have the Lord. Peace is about the presence of the Lord, not the absence of conflict, difficulties, troubles. And, uh, and I think that's really important for us to understand. And as we have opportunity to share with others, it's certainly something that ought to attract people to our Lord and, and to the faith that we share. So that's where we'll, we will stop for this evening. Um, next week, we're, we're going to begin looking at these words, the specific words uh, that, that we get the, the word in English, peace, from. Uh, the, uh, the Old Testament word shalom and some others that might give us even a richer understanding of what this really is and how it applies to us. So again, I hope you're, you're doing well. Uh, Lancaster people, hopefully we're able to meet this coming Sunday. Uh, we got snowed out last week, uh, but uh, we missed being together. Hopefully we'll be back together this coming Sunday. Although it'll probably still be cold, won't it? Uh, but God's blessings on you and 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 I hope you're enjoying the peace that is there for us in the Lord. Let's pray as we finish this evening. Holy God, thank you for the day. <clears throat> Every day you provide for us and care for us. And you've shown us in countless ways how you love us. Thank you for giving us peace. And this is something that ought to really be attractive to people in our world. Um, help us learn how to share it with others. Pray your blessing on each one who's part of the study. And may you strengthen them. May they learn more of you and, and better how to follow in the footsteps of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.